Well, welcome everybody. We've got a nice crowd here, um, so we're getting ready to get started. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, uh, Robin is going to read a logistics slide to you, and then I'm going to get started with my introductory presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, just wanted to run over some housekeeping logistics for you. If you're connected to the program and you're having audio difficulty, please just dial the telephone number along with the passcode here in order to have access so that you can listen to the session uh, via your telephone. Um, all attendees entering this session will be muted upon entry, so uh, your microphones will not be able to turn on. To manage your views, you can change the views that you see this session in by looking at the little buttons up on top the right-hand corner, and you can change your view. Uh, only the speakers will have their microphones where they can turn their microphones on and off. Questions for this session will be answered via the chat box throughout this program. So please put uh, put your questions and or your comments in the chat box, which is located on the right hand side corner of your computer screen. Thank you so very much and I'll pass it over to Heather now. Thank you, Robin, appreciate that. I'm going to go back a slide just so I can introduce um, the first speaker and go through a few things. I want to welcome everybody to the April CFPB Financial Education Exchange webinar. My name is Heather Brown and I'm going to be your facilitator for the webinar. Um, the CFPB Financial Education Exchange, or as we call it, CFPB FinEx program, is, provided, is providing this webinar to financial practitioners that are subscribers to our CFPB FinEx list. If you are a financial practitioner but did not receive notification of this directly in your box, it came through someone else, I will show you in a few slides how to actually get signed up for our list so you can get information directly on, on uh, webinars, research tools, and other resources we provide financial practitioners at the Bureau. Um, our topic for today is the FDIC Money Smart for Young People. Um, it's a newly launched revision of the program. And we're going to have three presenters today. Our first presenter is going to be Leslie Jones. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Leslie now. So when I'm done with my slides, we can pass it right over to her. Leslie Jones is a youth financial education analyst at the CFPB. She is the former, she's also a former business teacher, instructional designer, curriculum supervisor, and developer. She advises on K through 12 financial education program issues and the development of national approaches to support K through 12 financial education. And she's truly an expert on that topic. And I rarely have ever asked her anything that she didn't know the answer to related to K through 12 or could refer me to someone that did. Um, so we welcome Leslie. We also have two other presenters, Brittany Burroughs and Sandra Raba, and both of them um, will be introduced right before their presentation immediately following Leslie's. So welcome, Leslie, Brittany, and Sandra. We're looking forward to all of your presentations. And thank you to our events managers, Robin uh, Jefferson Dixon and Susan Funk, for all the work preparing and co-facilitating with me. I appreciate you both. I'm going to move through my introductory slides and then hand it off to Leslie. First, I want to read a disclaimer that applies to all presenters um, on this webinar. This presentation is, made, is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau. It does not constitute legal interpretation guidance or advice of the Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by the presenters are the presenters own and may not represent the Bureau's views. The inclusion of links or references to third party sites does not necessarily reflect the Bureau's endorsement of the third party or the views expressed on that third party site or the products or services offered on that site. The Bureau has not necessarily vetted these third parties, their content, or any products or services they may offer. There may be other possible entities or resources that are not listed that may also serve your needs. The mission of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is that we are a 21st century agency that helps consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. This is the landing page that you will get to if you go to um, consumerfinance.gov 
and then um, you're going to click the consumer education uh, tab that you see at the top there. Um, when you get to our page, this is where most of the information is that rests for financial practitioners. And we also link to other consumer information from here that financial practitioners would find very useful in their practices. Um, in the middle, you'll see the webinar announcement. And under that webinar announcement, there's a it's difficult, a little bit difficult to see, but if you get to the page, you'll see it. Um, it says see details in previous webinars, and that's where you go for our webinar uh, archives. And we have webinars back to 2015, and we're in the process of getting ready to complete an upload of um, quite a few of them from the past few months. So keep checking back, and that's where you go to see the recording of the webinar, um, to get a copy of the slide deck, and also a transcript of the webinar. And you, as a financial practitioner, um, we welcome you to use those materials to create your own materials. The only thing we ask is if you change them, that you take our logo off and put your logo on them. Uh, but they're there for your use and that's the purpose. On the right, you'll see um, halfway in the About Us column down, um, there's a Join Financial Education Discussion Group. That's our LinkedIn discussion group. And once you join, you're free to post announcements there um, on programs and things that you have. We just ask that you try to stay away from really hard selling through there. But certainly if you're doing a financial education workshop and there's a reasonable fee, that's okay to be posted. Um, and then uh, those are the key points uh, that I wanted to provide for you. On every page of our website at the top right corner is the submit a complaint um, link. And we are having a heightened number of complaints during the coronavirus pandemic. And we encourage you to work with your uh, clients and help them if they're running into a problem that they can't resolve with their financial institution um, to file a complaint and the easiest way to do it is online. Um, but once you click that, you'll also be able to see a number in which you can dial in. OK, um, let's move on here. Um, so here's basically uh, the links if in case you, you can get a copy of these slides by sending an email to the CFPB FinEx box, which is the third email, third bullet here. Um, asking for a copy of the slide deck. Um, you can also wait to see it up on the computer and download it yourself if you'd rather do it that way. Um, but if you send a note to the box requesting the slides, you can get a copy. And these other links are things that we've all talked about, except the second link, um, which talks about how to order free bulk copies of our professionally printed and published um, hard copy of our documents. Every Pretty much everything we have is available for download, which is great for those that are still virtual. Um, but for those of you that may be starting to do more in-person sessions or one-on-ones, um, you might want to um, go to that site and order bulk copies of some of our publications and have them um, in your office so that you can use them as needed or send them somewhere when there is a class. Okay, that is everything that I had for you. Oh, I almost forgot the coronavirus webpage. Please feel free to check back regularly. I'm always recommending people. It's a really well done page, and I know the staff at CFPB has put a lot of time in and consistently updates it with the latest news. So if you have issues or know people with issues around mortgage and rent, um, around their student loans, they're running into scams, you'll find the latest information there. And we've also partnered with the associated agencies that um, relate to the topics with HUD for the mortgage and housing assistance, with uh, ED for so student loan information. So it's a great one stop shop page for coronavirus information to keep up to date. Now I will hand it over uh, to our next speaker, who is Leslie Jones. Thank you, Heather. And Heather's already introduced me, so I'm just going to say hello, welcome, and we'll get on with um, our information on youth financial education. So let me go to the next slide, and there we go. So my question for you is this, and if you want to answer in the chat, please feel free. What messages about money did you receive as a child from adults? I'll ask again. What messages about money did you receive as a child from adults? It doesn't grow on trees, that's true. Anybody else have any? messages they remember. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else type in, so I will go ahead and uh, and move along. For myself, I learned that 
adults don't talk to kids about money. And of course, I learned that because the adults in my life didn't talk to me about money. And that was very valuable lesson in the fact that I then, of course, as an adult subsequently made a multitude of mistakes that I had to learn from. Um, and that is what happens. Some of us get great messages like save, save, don't, um, money doesn't grow on trees, get really positive messages, actually get training from our parents or the other adults in our lives. But unfortunately, some of us don't. So as educators, it's very important for us to recognize that we might be providing the only positive financial literacy information to a child that they receive. Now, the question of what is financial well-being is a question that the Bureau asked and defined in 2015. And let me show you what that definition is. This is the definition that they, they uh, developed, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to interpret it for you. It basically says what you, what, how you feel about your money is what's really important. Some people never feel like they have enough. Some people feel like they have an abundance. And so it's how you feel, how you manage your money that determines whether or not you have financial well-being. Let me give you an example. You've probably heard of athletes who earn millions of dollars or lottery winners who win millions of dollars, but then make the news because they're broke. And you go, how could that possibly be? But it's because they had a lot, but because they spent more, they end up not having so much. The really important thing is knowing what, um, how you want to use your money. We have different things that motivate us. We have different ways that we use our money. For some people, it's financial well-being is leaving a legacy. It's um, donating a lot of money to, uh, a, for set up a scholarship fund. For somebody else, it might be putting their children through college debt free. For somebody else, it might be a girl's trip they take every single year. We all have different ideas about what financial well-being is. Let me get down into a little more detail. There are four elements of financial well-being, and they're having control over your day-to-day, month-to-month finances. They're having a capacity to absorb a financial shock. They're having the financial freedom to make choices, to enjoy your life, and to be on track to meet your financial goals. In 2019, FINRA did a study, and we discovered that 40% of Americans could not afford a $400 emergency. And the Bureau thought that was very uh, important information, and we proceeded to try to work on trying to help and encourage people to start saving up. But then 2020 happened, and we realized that it was even more important than we realized to help people um, obtain financial well-being, to get control over their day-to-day -day and month-to-month finances, and to have capacity to absorb a financial shock. So. I'm going to switch off of adult financial well-being because you're here to learn more about youth financial capability. And what happened after the Bureau defined adult financial well-being was they logically asked themselves the question, how do we get kids to be adults with adult financial well-being? And they came up with this information, these three building blocks of youth financial capability. These building blocks are executive function, financial habits and norms, and financial knowledge and decision-making skills. And these are grouped into three developmental stages, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood. One of the things I love about this, if you notice, is that it's telling us that we can start teaching youth financial capability at the age of three. That's great. We can work with it with our little people even before they get in school. So the CFPB not only has resources for parents and caregivers, but we also have resources for K-12 education, for post-secondary education, and I shouldn't just say us, it's also, the, it's also FDIC. We have built resources for these age groups because we recognize that building youth financial capabilities starts when they're little, 
and continues, well, let's face it, it's not just youth financial capability, it's also adult financial capability. Let me explain these in a little bit more detail. Executive functioning skills are self-control, planning, problem-solving skills. It's that ability to tell yourself no. That's a simple way to be able to say it. And so um, it's a great time in early childhood to teach kids that. The important thing about having executive functioning skills is that telling yourself no is what you're going to have to do as you start to save for retirement and you're putting that money aside as you get to be a young adult. And it's telling yourself um, to put save money aside for college or for the, morg the mortgage you'd like to have someday and that down payment you need or the car that you would really like to have or drive. Being able to save is to tell yourself no. So that is why starting at three to five to tell yourself that and teach yourself that or for us to help teach our little people that is so critically important. The next is financial habits and norms. Those are rules of thumb that help you navigate the financial world. An example is when do you pay bills? For some of you, the answer is, well, I pay bills at the beginning of the month. For some people, I pay bills at the end of the month. For some people, it's, I pay the bill as soon as it gets in. And if I asked you why, you could give me an answer, but it probably takes a few seconds. You have to think about it. I don't know, why do I do that? For some of you, it's because you, um, you will end up uh, paying when you get paid. And for other people, it might be for, well, a variety of reasons. For my father, he pays bills two months in advance. And when I asked him why, he said, well, then I'm never late. And I know there's a greater story behind that, but I haven't asked yet. Another financial habit in Norm is say about retirement. How are you going to, um, how are you going to fund your retirement? What does it look like? What's your rule of thumb for that? Do you always make sure you get your employer match? Do you always make sure it's 10%? What, what are your rules of thumb? And then one last one is giving to charity. How do you choose to give to charity? Do you welcome people approaching you um, as you're walking down the street? Or instead, do you um, prefer to give to charity through your paycheck? We have different options. People have different rules of thumb. And then finally, financial knowledge and decision-making skills. We all do this. We do this well. In fact, you're about to learn some great techniques for uh, providing children with financial knowledge and decision-making skills through an excellent curriculum. But the Bureau just likes to encourage the use of comparison shopping as well as knowing what trusted resources of information are. It's all incredibly helpful. All right, so these building blocks can be developed using the Money Smart curriculum and the CSPB activities. And you'll learn more about that very shortly. I've got one other thing I want to share with you, and that is money as you grow for parents and caregivers. Before I turn this over to FDIC, I want to mention these web pages that help parents and caregivers by giving them conversation starters that they can use to help grow their child's money skills and habits. So before they enter the classroom, if you want to start working as a parent on building your child's um, financial capability skills, then this is a way to be able to get some information on how to do it as a parent or to provide it to a parent that's coming up to you asking for, what can I do at home to support what you're doing at school? So I'm gonna turn this over to Brittany, and um, I think we're also going to introduce her at the same time. Is that correct, Heather? I'm sorry, yes, Brittany is gonna actually introduce herself and Sandra. Thanks, Leslie, great presentation. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Heather. So good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Brittany Burroughs, and I'm currently a community affairs specialist in the outreach and program development section at the FDIC. So I've been at the FDIC about seven years now, um, with the last four of those working in community affairs. So I wear, thank you so much for switching the slide, I forgot. Um, so I wear many different hats. So I work on things such as the Money Smart News, the Money Smart Alliance, 
but my main focus and priority is being the project manager for the Money Smart for Young People curriculum, which we're going to talk about today. So joining me is my colleague, Sandra. And Sandra has been at the FDIC for 11 years, um, with the last 10 of those being with her working as a human resources specialist in the work life program. Here in Community Affairs, though, we are lucky to have her um, working on a special project detail in Community Affairs as a Community Affairs Specialist. So while, while she's here, Sandra's working on many different things, um, including the Money Smart Alliance, the Money Smart for Young People, and many other projects, special projects. Next slide, please. So today we will be discussing a few exciting resources that we have here at the FDIC, including our Money Smart for Young People, our newly enhanced Money Smart for Young People curriculum. So the, the MSYP, as we affectionately call it, <laughs> consists of four different series that are broken down by grade level. So we have the pre-K to grade two, the grade three through five, um, the six through eight, which is referred to as our middle school curriculum, and then the nine through 12, which is our high school curriculum. So in addition to this, we will also discuss our newly launched Get Bank website, which provides helpful information on account access and opening bank accounts. And then lastly, we will co cover other helpful resources like our My Money, My Money Smart website, um, our Money Smart news publication, and our Money Smart Alliance program. So now I'll turn it over to Sandra, who will discuss Money Smart for Young People and other resources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, let's go to the first slide. Thank you so much, Brittany. Sorry, we're just having some technical difficulties. Um, I hope everyone can hear me now. Um, we will start with the um, Money Smart products. Next slide, please. Okay, economic inclusion. The um, We have, Five priority areas in the FDIC for economic inclusion strategic plan, um, which is visually a ladder. Today, we are gonna focus on financial education. Um, so before we get started, I did wanna highlight um, under the second priority of insured deposits, our FDIC Get Banked initiative. Uh, this, began, this began at the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, um, as we um, wanted to inform consumers about how to open a bank account online and how to facilitate the safe and timely distribution of economic impact payments through direct deposits. So the FDIC worked with the IRS and other partners to help direct consumers to where they could open an account online and have their stimulus funds deposited electronically. So I just wanted to let everyone know that this website was developed at the beginning of the pandemic, and there's tools to open an account online on the website, along with um, account shopping checklist and tips for managing a new account. So let's get started with Money Smart Projects. Products. Products to teach to others. So we have the Money Smart for Young People, pre-K to tw grade 12. We have Money Smart for Young Adults, ages 12 to 20. Money Smart for Adults, small businesses, and older adults, and products to help you learn on your own, which include the computer-based CBIs, uh, the Money Smart Podcast Network, and My Money Smart. The implementation tools include the Money Smart News and Money Smart Alliance. So you will see in this new enhanced version um, the implemented CBIs, um, and we will review um, the other products moving forward. Next slide, please. The FDIC's role includes um, to distribute money smart, to teach, train the trainers, provide technical assistance, highlight promising ways to money smart and supporting resources. Next slide. Why are we here today? 
I think we can all agree that there is a need for effective financial education of young people in the US. The FDIC knows that the financial education has the potential to help improve how people manage their finances, and these changes are observable long after the training. Next slide. All right, so our goals. The goal of the CFPB and FDIC partnership is to empower American youth to make better financial decisions to achieve their own goals throughout the stages of their lives. Next slide. The FDIC, in collaboration with CFPB, launched the Money Smart for Young People series. It features four free curriculums that are designed to promote financial understanding in young people. So if you see on the slide, our curriculums include grades pre, pre to K2, grades three through five, six through eight, and nine through 12. So let's look at the next um, series highlights. Okay, uh, the Money Smart curriculum takes into consideration feedback received from the diverse focus groups of teachers and parent caregivers who reviewed all materials to determine ease and use integration into existing curriculum, and tools to assist in teaching financial literacy. Um, Sandra, this is Heather. I just want to make sure we're, our, I think we may be behind on a slide. I want to get caught up real quick. Um, and okay. what is the heading on the slide that you would like to be up? Uh, now we're on the next slide after this. So involves educators, students, and parent caregivers. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. This Money Smart product um, series involves the teacher, student, and parents. So let's um, look at this slide. The Educator's Guide offers lesson plans that include hands-on activities to promote student participation in the learning process. So for students, we have each curriculum includes worksheets and other resources that let students explore the topics covered in each lesson and apply their new knowledge. And lastly, for um, a guide for parent and caregivers, this has information about topics and terms being covered in class conversation starters, online and literally it, literacy resources, along with activities to try at home and around town. So the next slide, we're gonna look at parent and caregiver guide. These guides can be used on a standalone basis by parents whose kids are not necessarily going through Money Smart classes. So this is what the parent caregiver guide uh, table of contents looks like. And we can go to the next slide for the uh, sample parent caregiver guide. So this is the sample caregiver guide uh, grades nine through 12. So the parent guide is meant to serve as a connection between the classroom and the home. The topics covered in the classroom are identified by the lesson and an overview and given for each topic. This can also be a great resource to use for PTA meetings, parent education nights, and other community activities. Next slide, please. The Educator's Guide for Pre-K to, pre, pre -K to, to Second Grade has six lessons with hands-on cross-curricular activities that engage preschool through second grade students, roughly ages four through eight, in discussing and exploring key financial concepts. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at grades three through five. The educator guide has eight lessons for third, three, third through fifth grade students, often ages around eight through 11. So this is um, some of the lessons that are on there as well. Next slide, grades six through eight. The educator guide has 12 lessons with hands-on cross-curricular activities that engage sixth through eighth grade students, which is typically middle school, in discussing and exploring key financial concepts. Next slide. Grades nine through 12. The high school educator guide has 22 lessons for nine through 12th grade students. For example, students learn st strategies to protect their personal information, as well as the consequences of identity theft and different real world scenarios from phishing to text message scams to detecting employment fraud, uh, students learn how to differentiate between the common deceptions. They also research methods to protect themselves. Okay, so grades nine through 12. Um, next slide. These are just um, additional lessons um, that are on there. As I mentioned, there's 22 lessons. Next. Okay, so what's new? Um, 
new and improved look for the format. Um, so this is the enhanced version. Um, student links um, suggested sites to reinforce learning. The new format also uses slightly different icons to identify each lesson. Starting in 2018, the FDIC worked with a contractor to provide feedback on a new proposed format for the Money Smart for Young People um, lesson plans. So in addition, the contractor solicited feedback from educators who provided detailed comments and on to clarify the usability and a new proposed format for the perspective of end users. So um, FDIC worked with a contracting company to receive this feedback when implementing the new enhanced version. Next slide. So what are our educators saying? These are some feedback from a few of our focus groups that we had. So my students and I both enjoyed the Money Smart for Young People. Um, my students found it very exciting and engaging while I found it very simple to implement into my math classroom. So we've had all this great feedback. I'll, next slide. I'll just read a couple more. Uh, the lessons stand alone yet create a cohesive and com comprehensive curriculum. Next slide. Um, the materials provide you with everything you need from participant materials to slides to teacher guides. They take the stress out of the preparation part of teaching a class and allow you to focus on ensuring the students are learning about how to manage their finances. So we've definitely had some great feedback. Next slide, please. These building blocks are currently being incorporated into the Money Smart for Young People. As of now, only the nine through 12 and the six through eight levels have been added building block activities. We're working to incorporate them into the other levels by the end of this year. Next slide. Here's a quick look at how the educator guide was formatted before versus how it is now. So teachers mentioned that they teachers had mentioned that they didn't always have access to colored printers, so we made the educator guides black and white. So if you look on the screen, you can see the difference between the previous one and the new format. Next slide, please. The lessons at a glance section provides the teacher with a summary of lessons, objectives, and suggested time required for each lesson. It's a great snapshot of what it is in the curriculum and allows educators the information needed to design lessons or embed financial literacy topics into existing curriculum. So here's a sample educator guide um, screenshot if you want to look at the slide. Next slide, please. Extended exploration section. Um, there of the educator's guide, there's an additional example of activity ideas across the curriculum. There's, this is where the building blocks that I had mentioned earlier are also located. Next slide, please. Sample PowerPoint. So this is um, a sample of the grades nine through 12. Next slide. And this is a sample handout of grades three through five. So it has the short-term goal, the long-term goal directions, and then a situation um, where they can answer um, the questions afterwards. Next slide. Each level of the curriculum is linked to several key educational standards. The National Jumpstart Coalition Financial Literacy Standards Common Core Standards for English Language Arts and Mathematics, National Standards of Economics, and Partnership for the 21st Century Skills. There is a table in the back of each level that shows direct connection to specific standards. So here's the connection to standards um, example. Next slide, please. Later this year, we'll be launching our pilot teacher resource group, which will consist of Alliance members who have self-identified themselves as K through 12 educa educators or people who regularly teach financial education in the classroom. This group will receive additional support, such as teacher-focused webinars, early notifications about Money Smart Youth product updates, one-on-one -on -one calls, special giveaways, um, as well as serve as a resource to provide feedback on curriculum and promotional materials. Okay, next slide. So we have collaborated with our graphics team to create a digital toolkit that consists of the same lessons from Money Smart for Young People. 
These are formatted for digital use with fillable spaces that you can use on the computer for a Money Smart tablet. We can we have fun Zoom backgrounds you can use in te when teaching kids. Here's an example of what one of the Zoom backgrounds will look like. So you can see that on the slide as well. Okay, next slide, please. Youth banking. School savings programs are promising strategy to promote lifetime economic inclusion. Linking youth savings with financial education, lessons from the FDIC pilot, creating youth savings programs in the community, and youth banking network. Next slide, please. The curriculum is available through the Teacher Online Resource Center, which is uh, considered er, C-O-R-C. <laughs> the FDIC and CFPB collaborated to create the Teacher Online Resource Center. So teachers can access resources from across FDIC and CFPB that can support financial literacy instruction. It is available in English and in Spanish. Most not noteworthy, I wanted to let you guys know that the site features three videos that offer ideas on how to teach about money in the classroom. Pointers are provided in the videos on how to adapt them to different grade levels. They are filmed in the middle of a school setting so that it could be relatable as well. Next slide. Self-paced learning games. Compatible with desktops, mobile devices, they are flexible and can be completed in a one session, or they can pick it up later if they wanted to um, do a little and then come back to it. It's also an inter there's also an interactive game board um, design, a certificate of completion at the end, and most importantly, this is all a free service. Next slide. Money Smart Products Network. So this is the basics of banking, checking accounts, savings spending plan, and borrowing plan, or sorry, borrowing money. Next slide. Okay, here are some new resources. Um, so My Money Smart um, is one of the new resources that we have, making the most of your money smart with five building blocks, which are earn, spend, save, invest, borrow, and protect. Within these building box, there are 14 different financial topics to explore. Next slide. Okay, so first you select a building block, then you choose your topic. So as you see on the slide, um, the topics are organized by My Money 5. So there's the earn, spend, save and invest, borrow and protect. Next slide. Okay, every topic has four sets of resources. Um, so we have the key takeaways, the tools, the FAQs, and helpful links. Key takeaways is underlined on the slide because that's the default resource. Um, so basically, um, to get to the other resources, you just click on the titles, you go to tools, FAQs, and helpful links. Next slide, please. Okay, so visit My Money Smart today. This is what the um, uh, page will look like. So that's just an example slide. Next slide, please. Okay, the Money Smart Alliance program. Alliance members provide training, promote Money Smart, support local organizations that use Money Smart, evaluate Money Smart efforts. And you can always apply to be part of the Money Smart Alliance. And this is the link, it is just at www.fdic.gov slash money smart. Next slide. Money Smart News. So the Money Smart News uh, provides us with updates on the Money Smart program. We also post success stories, such as um, you know, when Money Smart users um, have a success story that they would like to share, um, then that will be in the Money Smart News. Um, also, submissions are welcome from anyone and how um, usually we have how a group of community banks uses Money Smart or teaches financial education within their community. So anything like that can be submitted as well for the Money Smart News. Next slide, please. 
The FDIC Consumer News is also helpful for young people, parents, and caregivers. It provides practical guidance on how to become a smarter, safe, safer user of financial services. Issues in selected articles offer helpful hints, quick tips, and common sense strategies to protect and stretch your hand hard-earned dollars. You can find a link to it from the Teacher Online Resource Center and from the Parent Caregiver website. So here is also the link on there. So fdic.gov slash consumers slash consumer news slash news. Thank you. Okay, so now let is, let's recap on the next slide. The FDIC relies upon countless instructors and fi at financial institutions, community-based organizations, local government entities that teach the curriculum as the FDIC is unable to teach money smart classes to consumers. At the FDIC, we're able to provide curriculum for potential instructors. We can provide technical assistance to those interested in the money smart. Um, we also have uh, capability of staff, we may be, if we are capable with staffing, we may be able to teach a train the trainer workshop for interested parties. We also here to share best practices or research with respect to financial education programs as we do through Money Smart News, which is what we had just discussed. FDIC would like to hear from our school superintendents, our principals, and other school leaders on how we can support educators in your schools using the Money Smart curriculum. So we wanna hear from you and how you will use the Money Smart in your community as well. Next slide, we will now uh, turn it over for a question and discussion session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra, Leslie, and Brittany. Um, great presentations and a lot of information. And it's really interesting to see where you've gone with the new revisions for Money Smart for young people. Um, and I had several people asking about getting copies of the slides and we will send out a PDF of the slides to anybody that sends an email to that CFPB Finex um, box that was on the slide. Actually, Robin, if you wouldn't mind just moving ahead one more, then they can see where to request a copy. The third bullet down, you can request a copy of the slides. Thank you, Robin. Okay, we have a few minutes that we can actually take some questions. So if there's any questions you wanna add now, please feel free to do so. We did have an earlier question about um, why states didn't mandate training around this. And Leslie did respond in the chat to that individual, but I thought there might be some others that might be interested in knowing that answer. Um, so Leslie, do you mind summarizing that? Hi, um, I believe the question was uh, wondering about why financial literacy education isn't required um, in all states. And um, I, I, being a great proponent of financial literacy education, would love to see that, but, a, but uh, graduation requirements are set by each state for their residents. And um, those graduation requirements are what we call funded mandates quite often. And so for each state, they have to decide what's important for their residents and what they can fund. And so we're proud to know that there are 19 states that do require financial literacy education as part of graduation requirements. There are a number of other states that include financial literacy standards as part of their curriculum and the courses that students can take. And so the movement is happening, the change is starting to happen, but please advocate in your state if you are working in a state that does not require financial literacy education, uh, check out, I think it's jumpstart.org for some more information on trying to, I wanna say start the, the movement from the ground up from your school on up to the state level. Thank you, Heather. Oh, I'm sorry. There was one additional thing. Uh, the uh, the uh, FDIC and the CFPB absolutely advocate for personal finance to be uh, standards to be taught in courses um, in each state. We have an advancing K-12 uh, financial literacy guide as part of our research. So if you've never taken a look at that, please do because that information 
might give you some ideas about how to um, expand financial literacy education. And um, uh, so there is a lot of advocacy work going on. And if you reach out to us, I can send you some of those links. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that thorough answer to both of those questions. Um, I did not see any new questions come up in the chat. I did see that um, one individual um, sent a note to all panelists that said, um, the Jumpstart CEE National Financial Literacy Standards are currently being updated, are in draft format, and that this and he doesn't know when they'll be the revised standards will be released. Um, I don't know if, if Leslie or Sandra or anyone else knows anything about that. Um, when they're released, but if you want to either put it in the chat or let us know one way or another. Uh, but thank you for that information, Scott. And it looks like there are no other questions in the chat at this time. So I want to thank everybody for taking the time out of your busy days to join us for this webinar. Our next webinar is going to be on May 20th, and the topic is resources that you can use for older Americans month. So we're we're going from the youth to the older Americans. Uh, we look forward to having everyone back next month, and this will conclude our webinar for today. Have a great day and a wonderful weekend. Take care, everybody.